Kenya is best known for its teeming wildlife and breathtaking panoramas. It's also home to the iconic Maasai. But they are just one of over 50 different ethnic groups peopling the country, each with their own traditions and languages. A family of photographers, Dos and Bertie Winkel, and their daughter Femke, are here to search out how Kenya's traditional people are coping with the pressures to change. In this program, we focus on two of Kenya's conservation hotspots under threat, the game-filled grasslands of the Maasai Mara and the verdant slopes of majestic Mount Kenya, each area facing its own particular problems and, in turn, generating unique solutions. Dos and family begin their journey in Nairobi, the bustling capital of Kenya. It's hard to imagine today, but 150 years ago, this was a well-used Maasai watering hole, known as Inkare Nairobi, or cold water. Today, the Maasai lands lie a full day's drive away, on the other side of the Great Rift Valley, the biggest tear in the Earth's crust. The Winkles are heading for the Maasai Mara, the last bastion of the Maasai people, and home to George Rumager, who has agreed to introduce Doss and family to the tribal peoples of Kenya. Good morning, Simon. How are you doing, other? George knows this country like few others, having spent the first 12 years of his life growing up in a traditional Maasai village. Now, after years of flying as a bush pilot for aid agencies and charter companies, he spends much of his time supporting conservation projects in the area. Worried that they might get stuck in the mud, Doss decides to push on through the night. Once wet, this heavy clay turns into a substance more slippery than snow and ice. After a long night of slippery hell, we arrive in a glowing paradise. I start to get back my real Africa feeling again. I've traveled more than a hundred times to this extraordinary continent, and it never fails to affect me. The Maasai Mara is truly one of the world's natural wonders. In this pristine African wilderness, about 60 larger mammals and over 450 bird species have been recorded. It's a world renowned for its plains full of game and is perhaps the only remaining area in Kenya where wildlife can still be seen in the same abundance that existed centuries ago. The money spent by tourists visiting the national parks and reserves is a major source of Kenya's national income. Well, welcome. Finally. Nice meeting you. How are you? Good. How is the journey? Fantastic. Hi, Jerry. Is this actually the place where you grew up? Yeah, this is one of the places. We traveled uh, a lot all over the area. Most of the research my mother was doing was on the top of the escarpment yeah. with the, the Syria Masan. But this was sort of base. This became our, our base. Yeah. George's place lies on the banks of the Mara River, on the western edge of the reserve, at the foot of the Syria escarpment. This is also home to George's mother, Jacqueline Rumager Eberhardt, a celebrated social anthropologist who has lived and worked with the Maasai for over 40 years. She explains to Dos how she went out to work with the Maasai, taking with her her three small children. Jacqueline, why did you stay so long with the Maasai? Well, apart of, from falling in love with one of them, which was a very good reason to stay very a long time, <laughs> uh, it was because I would get nowhere in my uh, research if I did not live with them and get to learn about what was happening through my personal experience.
Almost immediately they adopted me and, the, and my children, and this is traditional with them. And uh, I am told that George speaks Maasai with no accent. George takes us up the escarpment, way off the beaten track, to meet a group of young Maasai warriors from Oran. <laughs> This village, or Manyata, has been especially built for the warriors. It's a temporary home and base for a complex set of preparations that will lead in a few months' time to one of the most important ceremonies in the life of a Maasai man, the Eonoto, which marks the transition from warrior to elder. For a warrior, this is a period of mixed emotions. The transition to elder will mean he can marry and take on more responsibility. But it also means an end to the freest days a Maasai man will ever know. Ole Naiguran is the leader of this warrior group. His job is to coordinate the activities of the Moran and communicate with the other warrior Manyatas preparing for the Eonoto. These Moran belong to the Syria, the smallest of the 12 Maasai clans and the least influenced by the outside world. So you bring the Olena Guron tells me that his family has known George since childhood. It's because of this we're getting such a warm welcome. <laughs> The women of the Manyata invite Bertie to help with collecting water. Traditionally, the Maasai don't drink water. They use it only to make tea, a habit learned during colonial times from the British. Oh, now the difficult part. The beadwork jewelry associated with traditional Maasai women is, like the tea, also a relatively recent adoption, introduced when Europeans began trading in glass beads. Before this, Maasai women decorated themselves with plain iron rings. And while these colors and designs appear today traditional, they don't in fact follow a rigid pattern. The arrangements and color choice are constantly changing, depending on the fashion of the year. Being traditional does not mean being static, not evolving, not going to something new. And the Maasai are expert at this. They can adapt to all new situations, but keep their roots. They are not, as we pretend, Stone Age people. They are all modern. <laughs> Ole Naiguran has brought Femke down to the Mara River to introduce her to some wildlife. They've killed people before, huh? Yes. They look so cute, but they're actually very dangerous. Curiously, these lumbering vegetarians kill more people per year than buffalo and lion combined. Johnny Baxendale, a friend of George's, 
who had done the aerial work for the film Out of Africa, offers to show me the Mara from the air. One thing you notice from the air is the network of animal tracks we see below us, crisscrossing the plains. The scene unfolding is as majestic and timeless as ever. But today, the Masai Mara is being threatened on all sides, from rampant poaching to deforestation and bushfires. Fire has been used for centuries to encourage new growth in the grasslands. But today this burning often goes out of control, seriously damaging the remaining woodland. The irony is that the Maasai Mara is one of Kenya's richest sources of tourist dollars. Yet until recently, very little of that money has gone to the upkeep of the park or to the surrounding Maasai communities. Much of the training for the Eonoto involves dancing. This follows a traditional set of rules and climaxes in a spectacular feat of jumping known as ipid. The higher the jump and the longer the warrior can keep it going, the more virility and vigor he shows. One thing that fascinates me is the way they jump. Almost without using their hips and knees, they use their calf muscles as though they have springs on the soles of their feet. That's an incredible experience. So we're just one of them. And this is all preparation for the Ionoto end of the warriorship. And then, at the end, the mothers will shave the hair of the warriors. Completely bald. And then they become elders. The warriors begin preparations for a meat feast. The secluded forest area is sought out and cleared. This barrier of branches is intended to keep wild animals at bay. Suddenly, I notice excitement among the Moran. For a moment, I'm not sure what's happening. It appears that one of the young warriors has found a bee's nest high in a tree. The charged feeling of excitement is infectious. This rare find is one of the few sweet treats a traditional Maasai will enjoy. You can eat it all, eh? Everything is consumed. Not only the honey, but also the wax and the growing bee larvae. All welcome added nutrition. While the warriors in the tree throw down pieces for us all to share, the real choice bits I kept for themselves. <laughs> that evening, Ole Naguran asks if I would stay the night in his hut. I gladly accept. For me, this is an encouraging sign of the trust building up between us. He tells me that I will be the first Olai Shumpai, or white man, to stay in the Manyata. It's a great honor. Super. <laughs> what is exactly the purpose of the Ionoto? Uh, the means of Ionoto is to be graduating to, to the last time of warriorism, to finish that step of warriors. So, yeah. how long do they stay in this Manyata uh, for that purpose? Uh, about three months to four. 
yes. here in this film. The Moran continue with their singing and dancing well into the night. Their endurance is astonishing. I learn that this is partially due to a herbal stimulant that they are chewing. At the end of hours of dancing, we finally retire to the huts. After the chill of the night air, the smoky interior is surprisingly welcome. Exhausted, I fall asleep, only hazily aware of the swarming cockroaches. At dawn the next morning, we step out of the cozy hut into the cold. Olina Guran has lent me an old Karasha, the classic red Maasai blanket. The cow is central to the Maasai way of life. Here, cow dung is being collected for later use to repair house roofs and walls. And cow's milk still forms the cornerstone of the Maasai diet, sometimes sustaining them for weeks on end and providing them with all their vitamin C. To balance their diet, they drink cow's blood. This young warrior is learning how to puncture a hole in the carotid artery with an arrow. An elder steps in to show how it should be done. I lived for 11 years the Maasai way, eating and drinking only what Maasai would give me in the homes. Drinking blood. You know, I wasn't accustomed to that. And so I didn't want blood. So I didn't drink for three months and I became very weak. And then people told me, you're feeling very listless and weak because you don't drink blood. Try it. And I did. And it gave me a, a terrific boost. And then I asked uh, um, doctors about it, and they said, yes, because your diet had no salt. And through the blood, you're getting back salt in your body, which you need in hot climate. So you see, do things as they do. The leaf is added to help the healing. This may not be the neatest of jobs, but the calf will recover quickly and be ready to provide blood again in a few days. <laughs> the warriors begin their daily preening rituals. I'm fascinated to see that they spend hours grooming, plaiting, shaving and coloring their hair and body with red ochre mixed in sheep's fat. <laughs> but there's one warrior who needs a little more help with his makeup than the others. So what does it feel like to be back in the Maasai village? Uh, it certainly brings back a lot of memories. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mainly, you know, very good memories. I was like all these little kids. You know, these were my friends. These were, uh... So what did you like most of living with the Maasai? Well, I think it's their, uh, their pride. Their pride uh, as to who they are, uh, not giving up. Uh, so easily, you know. Um, they've learned to, to take the best of both worlds. You know, take what they need out of perhaps the Western side and discard what they think is not, you know, necessary for them. But yesterday we were talking about uh, the fact that there's so much wildlife <laughs> left in, uh, in mainly Maasai areas. And they've got tremendous respect for the environment they live in. That explains why we've got these fantastic areas left. They should really be given uh, more credit for that than they, they actually get. The Mara Conservancy is a rare initiative looking to do just that. For the past year, Brian Heath and his team have taken over the running of one-third of the Mara Reserve. 
and in doing so, channeling the money raised from tourism back into the local Maasai communities. In just its first year, this amounted to 10 times that previously collected. It's early June, and the first zebras and wildebeest from the Great Migration are coming into this section of the reserve from the plains of the Serengeti in the south. There's Topi, there's Thompson Gazelle, Impala, zebra. Brian, do you consider the Maasai people conservationists? I think that the Maasai are probably the best conservationists in the world. If it wasn't for the Maasai, the Maasai Mara and the Serengeti wouldn't be here, it wouldn't be the spectacle that we have now. It is their tradition, their culture of living with, with the animals, which has enabled the world to benefit from this now. So this is a wonderful example how culture and nature can go hand in hand. Yes, it's especially true of pastoralism and conservation, but not true of agriculture and conservation. Why not agriculture? Because people can't afford to have animals eating their crops which they're growing, essentially. Pastoralism, just by definition, is extensive use of land, whereas agriculture is intensive. In just its first year, the Conservancy has booked a number of major successes. 150 kilometers of road have been repaired, buildings have been restored, and the game wardens are being paid again. The resulting boost in morale has led to an aggressive action against poaching. We've done a lot on security. We've arrested 77 poachers, recovered a lot of wire snares and made the whole area much, much more secure for the people and the wildlife that, that live here. At that moment, we get a call on the radio. Some of Brian's men have found more snares. We race to the location. The wardens are all armed and trained to shoot on sight. Oh, this is very tricky, look. They do that with the, with the grass with the here. small grass there, yeah. Oh, no, we find 15 yeah. snares yeah, set in the bushes near a small creek. So strong, so Judging from their size and the height they've been thing. placed, so we it looks like now. the poachers were after it's elephant or hippo. This would not be for ivory, but for meat. And who is buying, who is buying this bush meat? We don't know yet. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Big restaurants yeah. or so? Or Maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. On the way back to the Manyata, they encounter a group of lions, one mother and seven nearly full-grown cubs. In the heat of the day, they're not up to much more than a doze. Look, 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 look. Don't let them chase him away, eh? They won't chase him away. Okay. Back at the Manyata, all hell's broken loose. It turns out that this fight training is another vital part of the warrior's preparation. The main thing is self-control. Because when you have that type of self-control that the warrior acquires, you are on top of everything. They learn strategy, vigilance. They will tell you, if a man comes to steal your cattle, do not blame that man. Blame yourself for not having been vigilant. Now that's a great lesson of life. Finally, it's time for the meat feast. To supplement the normal diet of milk and blood and build their strength for the upcoming Eonoto, a young bull has been selected for slaughter. 
The animal is swiftly dispatched by severing the spinal cord at the base of the skull. The blood is carefully collected and the skilled process of dismembering the carcass begins. Being a vegetarian, this is not the nicest part of their ceremonies to watch. But on the other hand, these people kill only a few cows a year and the animals had a wonderful life before that. And you can't compare it with the terrible bio-industry, for instance, in the Western countries. Each and every piece of the animal is used. Special delicacies include the blood drunk warm from the skin, marrow sucked from the bone, and the most choicest pieces of meat some of it eaten raw. <laughs> to finish, the digestive juices are squeezed from the stomach contents and drunk. It's believed to be an effective preventative for malaria. Later, the Moran gather in the woods around Olinaguran and the Labon, the most powerful men in the community. Well, a Laban is, um, I translate by ritual leader. He also is a diviner. So each warrior manyata um, chooses a specific Laban to protect them. Well, after a short blessing, that's the chalk that you see on their faces, put by the Laibon and uh, Olinagoran. They're going to sing and talk about harmony, peace and friendship. The Moran returned to the Manyata, a slightly incongruous sight, macho warriors hand in hand. A whole age group bound to each other for life. Here the individual counts for little. All energies are channeled to the greater benefit of the group. <laughs> Once back in the Manyata, the warriors begin the dancing again. Then, at a certain point, a number of Moran go rigid and begin to shake. They're in trance. I learn that these effects are in fact welcomed as a sign of emotional relief. Their companions watch over them carefully, making sure that no warrior gets physically hurt. <laughs> the Maasai are the society of action. Western society is a society of exploitation. It's not only of having, exploit everything. We have so much to learn from these other societies that have been able to maintain themselves in equilibrium with nature over long periods. In fact, their society has proved more efficient than ours. Whereas ours come and go, all the big civilizations, they are still there with their way of life. The struggle for a balance between people and wildlife being played out in the grasslands of the Maasai Mara is amongst the most high profile in Kenya. But the country's most serious conservation problem can be found on the lush green slopes 
of Kenya's highlands. We're in an exceptionally beautiful bamboo forest at the foot of Mount Kenya. And along the river here, there are very old trees completely covered with lichens and mosses and other epiphytes like orchids. And this is a primary forest, it's very old. We've climbed to an altitude of 13,000 feet to photograph a species of plant that only grows on this particular spot. We're climbing with a team of rangers of the Kenya Wildlife Service. It's their job to protect us from the big five that roam freely in the park. Lion, leopard, rhino, but especially buffalo and elephant. This is about 13,000 feet, approximately 4,000 meters. This is the most wonderful landscape you can imagine. And it changes the higher we get. It starts with the bamboo forest and then very old trees. And then we had the moorland. And then like here with the grassland. It's getting colder also and getting heavier and heavier to climb because of the lack of oxygen. But it's incredibly beautiful. At just over 17,000 feet, this is Africa's second highest peak. It's also the most important water catchment area in this largely arid country. In fact, the lives of three million people depend on the continued health of the forests on these slopes. Just over a hundred years ago, this mountain was barely known to the outside world. Stories of snow on the equator were ridiculed. But to the Kikuyu, who have lived in its shadow for more than 400 years, its summit is the home to Ngai, or God the Creator. The first people to settle here were known as the Ndorobo. They called the mountain Doinyo Egeri, or Spotted Mountain. The spots are actually giant lobelias that only grow on these slopes. And inside it has got some flowers. One of the species protects itself against the harsh climate by having developed a special kind of antifreeze. Protect it to regulate the temperatures that it requires. See? It's sticky. It's slimy, it's sticky. Yeah. So because of that, it can't it freeze. It can't freeze. And it grows in areas where it's very, very cold. Yeah, very cold. It's because of unique flora and fauna like this that in 1997, UNESCO declared the park a World Heritage Site. Its preservation is critical to the country as a whole, yet these pristine forests are increasingly being threatened by local people desperate to exploit the remaining resources. Bongo Woodley is at the center of this battle. As chief warden of Mount Kenya National Park, he's witnessed a decade of massive loss of forest through logging and charcoal burning. In the year 2000, the government gave him full responsibility for its protection. On his daily aerial patrols, he looks for signs of illegal logging, charcoal burning, and marijuana cultivation, all problems that are worsening as more people come to live on these slopes. Good morning. Good morning. You're Bongo. I'm Bongo. And Dos. Dos, pleased to meet nice you. Nice meeting you. Good. How was your flight? Oh, it was OK. Yeah, yeah? It's, it's fairly calm, because it's fairly early still. Yeah, that's good. So what's your main function, actually, here? Well, I'm the, the senior officer in charge of Mount Kenya National Park and National Reserve. And, yeah, I have a couple hundred people working for me. Uh, this place here is the National Park headquarters where the bulk of them are. This is the sort of administrative centre of management. 
Yeah, and then with the subhead. So. And your main task yeah. is? Security is my biggest priority. Yeah. Um, Everything is secondary to security, including tourism. You have enough people to do all this? Never enough. There's never enough, never enough vehicles, never enough. Uh, Money, never enough people, but I mean, that's that's the age-old story, isn't it? And you have to protect it against? Got to protect it against people who want to cut the trees for timber. Yeah. People who want to turn trees into charcoal. People who want to sort of move in and put, put farms in there. And of course, not to forget the wildlife poachers. Snaring, hunting with dog packs. Uh, you know, there's just so much pressure on this resource. Incredible. Yep. Before doing anything else, Bongo is keen to show me some of the more disturbing results of that pressure on the park. Since the Kenya Wildlife Service received additional funding, specifically to combat poaching, arrests have gone up dramatically, resulting in the recovery of an astonishing number of tusks, skins and traps. During one raid, the rangers found the skins of ten fully grown leopard. The implications are startling. As each animal occupies a territory of 10 to 15 square kilometers, it means that more than 100 square kilometers of forest are now without these magnificent animals who play such a vital role in this complex ecosystem. Poisoned arrows. Poisoned, yeah. Probably melted down batteries. Nasty poison, which will definitely give an infection. Oh, yeah. Snares made of steel cable. Again, these are capable of even snaring an elephant. Basically nails in the hopes that an elephant will, will tread on it. Yeah. And then not come back again. Yeah, you know, the most serious aspect of poaching is the bushmeat trade. Mm -hmm. Girl snaring. But it's taking out every little species in the forest, stuff you don't notice until it's, until it's suddenly absent. Elephant poaching, rhino poaching, that's high profile. KWS jumps on that in a big way. Mm. But your small stuff, the stuff you're not going to really notice, it's just being slowly removed out of the forest, slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah, before you know it, suddenly you've got... Extinct animals. Pretty yeah. much. Literally the bushmeat trade is going to be, is going to see the end of wildlife in Africa. But not all killings occur for fur and meat. As farms spread up the mountain, encroaching on the territory of elephant and other wild animals, conflicts between wildlife and people are on the increase. Yeah. Do the elephants eat the potatoes? No, they like the potatoes. it. They like it. <laughs> so they get it out with their feet, I understand, and then they, with the trunk, they pick it up. <laughs> they eat everything. Cabbages, cuckins. So this cabbage was not touched by the elephants. Yeah. And when they touch, they start growing like this. Yes. Yeah, but for them, this is paradise. Yeah. If you were an elephant, you would do the same. <laughs> so what is your solution? The solution is only to make electric fence. It's the only which can help yeah. us. I agree. Yeah. Then everybody would be happy. So that's the solution, eh? Yeah. So, money. Money. Uh, and you money. see that footprints here? And here, and there, and here. Bongo is guiding us through this dense bamboo forest to show us the main reason for protecting this mountain, water. This river is one of the many rivers flowing from Mount Kenya, originating in the glaciers and wetlands up the mountain. The Kenyan people are concerned, the rivers that flow from this mountain and the other four mountains of Kenya are literally essential for their survival. If they cut the forest down, fine, the rivers will flow, but only when it rains. And then you're going to have rivers flowing in spate or not at all, because there's nothing to hold the water back. This forest is, it acts as a sponge. This captures moisture, this captures rainfall. It makes the rivers flow. 
Walking through this jungle is not without danger, as it is home to buffalo and elephant. Suddenly we hear the sound of trumpeting. We hardly dare breathe. Among the group are two baby elephants, which makes the situation even more dangerous. And just ten seconds later, they've melted back into the forest. Hilde van Leeuwen has spent the past five years walking every inch of the mountain, producing the first detailed scientific study of elephants on Mount Kenya. I, I'm sort of more of an ecologist. I study elephants in forests, which means that I don't see them very often. I have to sort of study indirect signs of behavior and I look at their movements and their habitat use and what influences it. Elephants' distribution is very much determined both by geographical features and by people. One speaks of a resident population of around 2,000 elephants. The mountain would be sustainable for elephants if they had the entire habitat, because we're speaking of like 1.2 per square kilometer, yeah. which is sustainable. But of course, if you reduce the habitat by 50%, it's not so sustainable. Keen to see for himself the scale of the problem, Doss prepares to join Bongo on his daily patrol. Coming into view, you've got areas of land within the forest reserve where farmers are allowed to plant crops in amongst tree seedlings. As they tend for their crops, they're looking after the tree seedlings and that keeps everybody happy. The farmer gets free potatoes from, from the land. The forest department get free labor from the farmer. After about three years, the people move along to the next plot. Beneath us, just gone underneath our wing now, was a pine plantation. A lot of charcoal kilns there. And you can possibly see, yeah, there's some smoke. There's a charcoal kiln being set up there. The, the whole place is just being turned into charcoal. And it's not charcoal for their own use. This is basically for, for commercial purposes. Yeah, what we're hoping to do now is uh, send in some rangers and arrest some of these people. Charlie three from Gofromio. To tackle the poaching and charcoal burning, Bongo's rangers have a shoot-to-kill policy when confronted with aggression. Four teams of rangers are on constant standby, patrolling the area, always ready for action. I know from personal experience from walking in the forest when we came across loggers, loggers can be very hostile. Yeah. And even when you, they know they're doing something illegal and they're poor also, so they don't have a lot of money and they don't want to get caught. You get loggers who will actually go, go as far as attack you with a chainsaw despite the fact you have a gun in your hand. So it was an obvious thing to actually hand it over to the KWS. Actually, since KWS took over, I say there's a lot of improvement, but the logging hasn't completely finished, but it has reduced a lot. A lot of these young men go into towns looking for work and are unable to find work and uh, do not want to basically go back to, to, to the shambas, to the farms. And this is an alternative for them to try and make uh, a bit of quick money and possibly uh, start their own business later on. This generation really has to be uh, educated uh, and made uh, responsible for the forest, which is their heritage out here on the slopes of Mount Kenya.
Before leaving Mount Kenya, Bongo takes Doss up for a rare view of the summits. The air here is paper thin, temperatures well below zero. And for a moment, they come face to face with the full raw grandeur of what the Kikuyu call the Mountain of Brightness. Many Kenyans now believe that fencing is the only solution to conflicts between humans and wildlife in these densely populated areas. One of the most ambitious efforts at doing this can be found just 80 kilometers away in the Abadares, a mountain range supporting one of the largest indigenous forests in East Africa. Like Mount Kenya, the slopes carry a profusion of wildlife and over one million farmers who depend on its rich soils and rainfall. After landing at the Aberdeer airstrip, the Winkles are met by Colin Church, a retired businessman whose goal is to raise as much money as possible to protect the Aberdeer National Park. The conflict between humans and wildlife is being tackled here in a very straightforward manner, by putting up an impermeable barrier between them. I have the feeling that you have a very specific love for the Aberdares. Uh, I was born in Nairobi, but grew up on the slopes of Mount Kenya. Ah. So, uh, you see, I'm a mountain man uh, yeah, yeah. by birth. Morning, Dan. Morning, how are you? Good to see you. Good. Hey, you've really come on. In fact, uh, we have come very fast this time. Can I say we've got 10 more kilometers to complete the third phase? This section? Yeah, this section. Fantastic. Sounds very good. By now, 160 kilometers of fence has been completed, already making it the longest conservation fence in East Africa. With progress continuing at the rate of around one and a half kilometers per week, it'll be another two years before the full 320 kilometers are complete. Much effort is put into building a close relationship with the local farmers and getting their feedback on problems. I just basically told you that uh, before the fence was built, they had a big problem with lions and elephants coming in, lions destroying their livestock and killing the animals. But since the fence was put up, all this has stopped. The crops are now growing, the maize is growing, and the livestock is now safe. She's happy. He's uh, saying that before the fence, yes. the value of the land here used to be about 50,000 shillings per acre. Mm -hmm. But now it has gone up to almost 120 to 150,000 shillings. Wildlife in modern times has to be more managed because it cannot roam freely. But once you've got it, uh, you've got an area which is, which is um, secure. The security creates the environment for them to breed, for all the animals to breed. And uh, so our elephant population in the Abadares is very healthy, thriving and increasing. Um, and that will pose, in the long term, it will, it will pose a challenge as to how that is handled. But uh, you have to do that in a managed environment for wildlife in the 21st century. Mm. It's different from previous yeah, times. Unfortunately, but yeah. anyway. Yeah. The fact is, without the passion and dedication of the host of people fighting to preserve Mount Kenya and the Aberdares, these complex ecosystems would have little future. And the water supply for more than one half of the people of Kenya would be severely threatened. For years, the idea of fencing in wildlife was seen as no more than a stopgap measure. Now it offers perhaps the only immediate way for farmers and wildlife to coexist in populated areas. And many Kenyans now believe that a long-term sustainable future can only be reached by rekindling the old traditions and beliefs that brought with them a deep respect for nature. 
Since the late 1980s, the government has tried to discourage the performance of major Maasai ceremonies, claiming that these traditions have no place in a modern society. But the Maasai have shown that their way of life and the insights that they have into the natural world around them can inspire others to find harmony with the natural world. There's a Maasai saying that goes, it takes one day to destroy a house, but to build a new one takes months. If you destroy our way of life, to construct a new one will take at least a thousand years.